Hello and thank you to the Soul Biovascular Symposium for the invitation to speak to you today. It's great to speak and connect with everyone virtually. Thank you to all the coordinators for making this happen. I've been asked to speak about EVAR for infected aneurysms, promises, and limitations. Mycotic aortic aneurysms are different beasts than degenerative aneurysms. Aortic degeneration is caused secondary to infection that eats away at the actual structure of the aortic wall, uh, causing it to enlarge in a pretty quick and dangerous fashion. They're pretty rare. They comprise only about 0.65 to 2% of all the aneurysms. The juxtarenal or pararenal aorta is involved very frequently. Um, it's quoted as 25%, though I think in a lot of our practices, we do see it more commonly than that. It has a very poor prognosis with high risk of rupture, and it's affected uh, patients are often sicker elderly patients with multiple comorbidities. The perioperative mortality is quoted to be very high between 26 to 44% in some studies, given that these patients are so sick to begin with. Now, a full disclaimer, the treatment for mycotic aneurysms is a open repair. That is the definitive treatment that can get rid of the infection uh, and allow you to potentially uh, heal and get rid of all the infection that's within the body. The, def the open repair is done either in situ with a metagenic conduit, such as a uh, femoral vein and performing a neoaortoiliac system, uh, or rifampin-soaked background grafts. Additionally, the, you can also perform an extra anatomic bypass away from the site of infection with ligation and debridement of the local area. But endovascular repair does have a role as a temporizing therapy in patients who are acutely ill, who you can potentially bridge to definitive therapy or the treatment of non-operative candidates. Consider a patient such as this, a 73-year-old male who presented with urosepsis two months prior uh, that was found to have E. coli bacteremia that was treated with antibiotics. Despite the antibiotic treatment, both as an inpatient, the patient had persistent E. coli bacteremia, and over the course of two months came in and out of the hospital three to four times. Uh, eventually, the patient was admitted with worsening shortness of breath and bilateral lower extremity edema. Uh, of note, the patient had pretty significant uh, Alzheimer's dementia as well as atrial fibrillation. This is the CAT scan that we got at the time, and you can see early venous phase filling uh, with contrast material. And then as you come down in the aortoiliac segment, what appears to be a connection between the uh, arterial and the venous system, um, potentially a mycotic aneurysm that was forming an iliocaval fistula. After discussion with the family, the plan was to perform an angiogram under local anesthesia only, given that the patient's significant congestive heart failure and shortness of breath wouldn't allow them to lay flat, and then perform a possible EVAR uh, to cover the fistulous connection between the aorta and the uh, vein. Uh, here's the initial angiogram, and you can see there's a connection potentially between the aortic segment and much more definitively in the iliac segment as well. Uh, there appeared to be a second fistulous connection towards the bifurcation of the actual uh, iliac vessels. The patient uh, had a gore excluder placed with embolization of the right internal iliac artery and extension of the right iliac limb. Um, at this point, we didn't know how much the patient would actually recover. We chose a gore uh, excluder as it may potentially be easier to remove than some of the other stent grafts in the case that the patient did become a little bit uh, more stable and be able to tolerate an open procedure. Uh, Postoperatively, he did well with improvement of his shortness of breath, gradual improvement of his leg edema. We treated him with six weeks of IV ceftriaxone, which was then transitioned to lifelong PO doxycycline. The patient's dementia, however, did worsen, and the family decided to avoid definitive open treatment. And the patient's just followed up with us for his six month follow up CAT scan. He's been doing okay. Negative blood cultures, mild leukocytosis. Um, but slowly has been getting up and moving around a little bit better. When you look at the actual CAT scan, you no longer see that early uh, filling of the venous system. Um, however, you, when you do come down to the actual iliac system, you do still see some, some remnant of that sac that was there before. When you're considering EVAR for mycotic aneurysms, I think there's a couple of things to consider. Number one, the anatomy with any EVAR uh, is important. We talked about how oftentimes this happens in the suprarenal, juxtarenal, pararenal section. So it's important to know which branches are involved and it will significantly uh, impact your decision to treat with them with the EVAR or open. The overall stability of the patient is important. When a lot of the times the patient will come in in an unstable setting, but who is this patient when they're not this sick? What is their overall health? Can they tolerate a bigger open procedure? If so, then your decision may be a temporizing measure rather than a definitive treatment. 
the source and the organism is important. There are more virulent and aggressive organisms, um, while there are other ones that are a little bit more indolent. So depending on what the organism is, uh, it may affect your ability, uh, it may affect your decision in uh, how you're going to treat that patient, um, as well as the post-operative antibody course. Uh, we talked about this, the goal intervention is either temporizing to get them to a definitive repair, or this is it, this is the ter terminal therapy, and that's where you're gonna be ending. And then depending on the things that we discussed above, your post-EVAR antibiotic duration and follow-up protocol needs to be determined. There is no literature for this. I mean, there are literature, but it's based on smaller case series. There is no large based study that looks at endovascular repair for mycotic aneurysms. It doesn't exist. However, there are several case series have that where institutions describe their experience. For example, here's a paper out of the UK where they looked at 17 patients with mycotic aortic, aortic aneurysms, four underwent open repair, four were around that juxtarenal region. So there were surgeon-modified surgeon fenestrated EVARs and there were nine were straight infrarenal EVARs. And in their um, study, they note that for patients who underwent open repair, there were early complication rates of up to 50%, late complication rates of around 25%, and then the vascular repair, 23% in the early complication rate group, 30% in the late complication group. The numbers were very small, so it didn't reach any statistical significance. Their overall infection-free survival for everyone, whether or not it's open or EVAR, uh, was 94% at one year, which is a pretty good number. At three years, 87.5%, and at five years, 62.5%. And specifically, they noted that there was no difference between open and EVAR for infection-free survival. Now, this is a very optimistic, um, very positive kind of paper. I think a lot of us will um, anticipate that the patients who have a endovascular repair will have a uh, more significant lay complications in the open repair because the patient's uh, underlying bacterial load is not repaired. It's still in the patient. And the thought is that you know the endovascular repair is a palliative procedure versus a definitive procedure that you can have with an open repair. Here is a literature review in the IR um, uh, journals where they looked at 52 articles describing 91 patients who had stent graft treatment of mycotic aneurysms. Uh, many of them over half was during the suprarenal aorta uh, as we discussed. Their overall rates, when they looked at the outcomes described in these papers, the early mortality rate was 5.6%, uh, early mortality rate being within 30 days, late aneurysm-related mortality, 12.2%, late aneurysm-related complications, 7.8%, also both pretty good numbers, but this is at one year um, when we were discussing late aneurysm uh, outcomes. The most consistent predictor of poor outcome was development of an aortoenteric fistula. And while the, both of these papers might be drawing a more positive light, um, I think it is trying to demonstrate that the endovascular is not a, endovascular repair of a mycotic aneurysm is not a death sentence. There may potentially be um, some stability you can reach in some of these patients. Similarly, when you look at the literature for TVAR, uh, for mycotic thoracic aneurysms, and you look at a whole bunch of papers that range from one patient all the way up to 16 patients, this is kind of what you see. It's a little all over the place. Organisms can run the whole gambit from MRSA to E. coli to salmonella to mycobacterium tuberculosis. And the antibiotic duration varies from uh, just six weeks of IV antibiotics to lifelong oral to two months to lifelong. And you can see that there's significant variability in what the antibiotic treatment is. What this tells us is that this is not uniform whatsoever, and there is no standard of care that dictates what antibiotic duration the patient should be getting. Um, the outcomes are also kind of all over the place. 30% alive at two years versus 50% alive at two years versus 100% alive at one year. And I think what it's showing you is that it's not a uniform generalizable kind of procedure that you can kind of say, this is what your expected life expectancy is after a procedure like this. So much of it will depend on the patient's individual health status, as well as the aggressiveness of the infection. We talked about how the organism is important. Back in 2011, we published on a endovascular stent graft repair of a tuberculous mycotic aortic aneurysm, where the patient presented with a seven centimeter uh, mid thoracic, uh, uh, lower descending thoracic aortic uh, mycotic aneurysm. We put a stent graft in this uh, patient who was not a good open candidate, treated him with three months of anti-mycobacterial therapy, 
And we saw that the patient actually did well over a course of six, next 16 months. We saw the patient uh, shrink their aorta essentially back down to normal. And the patient has now been off of all antimicrobial therapy um, doing very well. And I think this goes back to highlight the fact that the actual organism is very important in knowing how uh, aggressive the infection may be. Last thing to touch on is rifampin soaked endograss. We've talked about how one of the open repair options is a open repair with Dacron a graft that's been impregnated with rifampin. Um, Dr. Escobar and his group, as well as some others that you can see in the literature today, talk about soaking the Dacron-based stent grafts with rifampin prior to implantation. Um, the side port for a Dacron-based endograft, such as a Medtronic Endurant or a Cook Zenith graft, is infused with 16 milligram to milliliters of rifampin solution that's put into the sheath. It's allowed to sit for one hour, which gives you that same kind of orange hue on your stent graft, which is then uh, implanted in the patient. Uh, we don't really have good data on it, but theoretically, the thought is that it's going to be something similar to a rifampin-soaked uh, standard Dacron graft, and it may have some benefits, though, you know, it is very unclear. Uh, so once again, there is no literature-based way of saying this is a good patient for endovascular repair or not. Uh, I think it has to be tailored to your own personal preferences as well as who the patients are. This is my current practice. I will consider EVAR for mycotic aneurysms as a temporizing measure to bridge into surgery or in patients who are just non-operative candidates that can't survive an open repair. For temporizing measures, I try to implant a easier to remove endograft, something that does not have super renal fixation, such as a core excluder graft or uh, endologics AFX. This actually comes out the easiest, something like this. Um, anything with a big super renal fixation stent, this is a trivascular ovation shown here, they're, they're painful to take out. So you wanna make it easy for you if you're using it as a temporizing measure. And the goal is only to cover the necessary portions. You don't need extensive coverage because you know that as soon as the patient's capable, you're bringing them for a open repair. For terminal treatment, I think we typically do more extensive coverage so that you don't have to come back. Oftentimes, even if you see a fistulous connection in the area, you see a damaged portion or unhealthy tissue in one area. Remember, this is an infectious pathology where a lot of the vessels surrounding that area of pathology is also unhealthy. So you want to cover more than you normally would um, for a arterial injury, for example. And you know you may want to consider rifampin soaking, though once again, it's not based on too much data. The post-procedure antibiotic duration really is determined by the patient's clinical status. How are they doing? Are they afebrile, doing okay, no white blood cell count? Um, do they have uh, negative blood cultures on your follow-up CAT scans? Do they have shrinkage of the aneurysm sac? Someone like that, you may want to consider stopping antibiotics after a short course. However, there's a very low threshold to keep patients on a lifelong suppression therapy because once again, EVAR for mycotic aneurysms is a palliative procedure and not a definitive procedure. So thank you very much again for your time and attention. I uh, look forward to meeting and speaking with all of you again soon.